Any any questions about the homework before we get started? Was anybody using it Saturday afternoon when uh, the disk filled up and the server just started saying nope? <laughs> it's uh, that fixed, and uh, like I, I got like I did it Friday night. Twenty twenty some three hundred one students emailed me because uh, homework was due that day. So. <laughs> Right. <coughs> and that, that, that's the right thing to do if uh, the only way to do the homework is on one of my servers and the server is down, then you can't do the homework. So that's just let, let me know and uh, I can give them an extra day. Uh, what I'd like to cover today is OpenSCAD. So it's a little bit weird that this is a computer science class, right? That like, yeah, how much computer is there in, you know, uh, building robot is mostly mechanical engineering. The control systems are mostly, you know, uh, control engineering, power. Uh, it's all electrical engineering. Maybe computer engineering for the firmware, but like, where's the computer part? I mean, the, the computer science in particular. Uh, so I, I claim, I claim there is actually quite a bit of software work that uh, that has to be done for many of these things. In particular, if uh, if I'm building a mechanical part nowadays, I'm building a parametric part. In other words, I don't just have one fixed design that I then make. 10 million copies of, because that's just not how the world works nowadays. Uh, what, what, what you have is I, I, have, I have one basic uh, design, but then uh, uh, it's going to have you know different attachments. People are going to customize. It's, there's going to be the big version, the little version. There's going to be the, the cheap economy version. There's going to be the, uh, the super high-end premium version. Right? So, so configurability is super important. In most CAD, so, so CAD is computer-aided design, and I'm trying to basically design a 3D shape. So I'm trying to make a, uh, uh, I mean, the, the output that I'm, I'm looking for is going to be this, uh, uh, you know, a, a, some sort of three-dimensional shape. Most CAD programs, they're designed for somebody to click out one part, and then they have some afterthought add-on to say, oh, you can change various small pieces of it. Uh, and, and they're not designed as programming languages. So OpenSCAD I really like because it's designed ground up, like no compromises. It's a programming language. And then uh, uh, the output is going to be a part. Actually, the, your ability to click on things is actually fairly limited uh, with it. So uh, I'm going to start in 2D because that's where a lot of uh, a lot of designs actually it's just much easier to think about uh, what's happening in 2D. So I, I'm going to start in 2D. So this is really a programming language. It's got uh, basic language primitives, built-in stuff like square. So I can uh, I can do a square and I'll make it two by two. So uh, I'm going to press F5 because that's the standard Visual Studio like debug run. Like so, that's the so, so this is the, the debug thing. So uh, let's see. So if, if I go ahead and zoom in, you can see that I, I've just made a square. It's two units. Uh, you get to decide what you want units to mean. It uh, I mean the, the CAD programs don't care at all. Of course, this is super duper important. Like if I uh, uh, I want to actually print things, I need to pick a consistent size. I always use millimeters. I've seen every other possible unit. I mean, uh, uh, architecture is done in meters in the rest of the world, and it's done in feet in the U.S. Uh, centimeters, I've seen uh, a bunch of. Uh, it's apparently, the default in like Unity, uh, all 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 dimensions are the centimeters, and it's the default in Op uh, Autodesk Inventor. Uh, but then, uh, as far as I can tell, most uh, you know most printer configurations, it's all millimeters. So. E easier, easier if you can stick with one, and no one ever seems to be able to do that. So I, I claim this is a programming language. So the first thing you need in a program, so so I mean, okay, it's cool that I have primitives that uh, uh, language primitives that give me geometric primitives. That's that's nice. Uh, but I, I want to be able to. Pr so I I, I don't want to say, say square twice. So I'll uh, I'll pick the size, and uh, I can just make up a new variable name to be two. So now my square is going to be size by size, and uh, that's that's exactly the same. Ah. Uh, there are there are a few weird differences with OpenSCAD because, for example, if I say first square, and then I'm going to do another square that's twice as big, for example. So here's my second square. Uh, it doesn't matter what order I declare those squares in, right? Like, you know, do do one, then then do the other. Uh, so for some reason, they say, they they decide that it, it'd be really cool if it didn't matter what order I declare variables in. So I can declare, so I can use a variable all through the program, and at the very end say, "Oh yeah, that variable has this value," and and it's because it's sort of like it, it's uh, geometry is not sequential, right? It doesn't like it's not like, you know, if I have a uh, you know a robot, it's got some linear order that it does all the robot parts or something, right? There's 
the, the parts are all there. They are all kind of simultaneous. So there's an obvious question here. Well, yeah, what if I reassign? So size stairs square. So size start off being 2,000 because I want it to be 2 meters. Well, uh, you overrode it. It's uh, it's 2, right? And it, and it stays 2. So uh, you, you, this is a little bit weird. Actually, uh, I, I, I've seen this a lot in OpenSCAD libraries. It's not quite as horrible as it sounds like. So for example, what you do in the library is if you have a bunch of parameters, you just declare them as global in global constants, right? And then they're all used for all your stuff in the, the in your library. And if somebody wants to overwrite them, they just overwrite, so they import your library, and then they just overwrite the values that they want to overwrite, and then those are the new values. And those those values propagate back up into your library. Okay, I think <coughs> I've seen something like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, so uh, this was actually designed by people doing functional programming, actually like, you know, mathematician type people. So, th so they thought like, this is not a crude imperative language where you say how to do things one at a time. And it's, uh, the, the, slowly they've, they've been getting backed away from that uh, absolutist statement, but that's, uh, that, that's the original design of this thing. So, uh, so I got primitives like square. Uh, there's a primitive uh, called uh, circle. Uh, let's see. So if, if, I do, if I do a circle, then I, I can specify the radius. So radius might be size. And uh, to do that, and uh, oh, no, this is, this is interesting. So I, I told it it's two. Uh, by default, it sort of assumes you mean two millimeters. So you can see the circle it uh, it draws here is actually pretty crude. So this is this is and, and uh, if I make the circle bigger, then the uh, the approximation actually gets more accurate. So you can see that it, it's 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 actually willing to use a different number of sides depending on how big the geometry is. It's got some. Yeah. So so if uh, if I'm doing two, and I want uh, really high precision, then. Uh, this is also a little bit weird. There's a there's a built-in called fs. That's the st dollar sign. Says like it's a special uh, variable, and uh, uh, this is the, the sort of step size. So I usually do 0 0.1 because that's about. How, I mean 0 0.1 below that, you know, your printer accuracy starts to dominate. Uh, yeah. It, it, now th there are certainly times when I've got a really huge, giant, complicated object. That I, I want to make this thing as crude and coarse as possible, so maybe I'll have a preview version. So I'll, I'll just stick with the default, which I think is 0 0.5 or something. So it, uh, th th that's the geometric infidelity it's willing to tolerate, right? So it's going uh, uh, it, it, to, it's going to, you have like a circle, for example, that takes an infinite number of straight line segments to approximate. Uh, we, we always use straight line segments in uh, everything uh, involved here. Uh, so, so uh, I, I, I should say one big difference between OpenSCAD and virtually all grown-up CAD programs is the grown-up CAD programs all represent curved surfaces in uh, the, like that's sort of a native primitive is these curved surfaces called NURB surfaces, uh, and uh, they they use they use the stupid triangle lists for OpenSCAD because that, that's what all 3D printer output they take stupid triangle lists it's just it's only triangles they only represent flat surfaces so kind of a kind of a uh, a difference there. Uh, so let's see. So I, I've just de defined a square and a circle. So I've, I've got these two objects right there. Now, uh, by default, it just sticks them all together. So you can see I've got the square and then the circle just sitting on top of it. So you can uh, you can combine these primitives. So as we, we've got the built-in language primitives for doing you know all the things you would expect. But there's also cube and cylinder that we'll look at in a sec. The three D shape. Uh, but you can also do like a, a, a constructive solid geometry difference. You have to spell it correctly. It's hard sometimes. So this would be square minus circle, and uh, see, I guess I'll leave size down here. So I, I you know, I, I uh, curly braces totally a thing. So we're going to uh, to say that's a square minus a circle. Let me put in uh, enough detail. You can see it there. So I've got uh, basically you know, the sharp corner and then the rounded. Uh, so, so this is the the circle has been subtracted out. And uh, yeah. Can you translate this? Way? You can absolutely translate things around. So, uh, so translation. Uh, so, so the, the weird part about this is there's a bunch of language keywords that do geometric stuff, right? And it's, it's it feels exactly like a programming language. I get variables, like you know, worrying about my data structures. Uh, it, it, we'll see in a sec that it has for loops. Uh, but, but it's uh, so, so. So translate, for example, is a primitive, and uh, you give it a, a vector thing, the direction you want to translate it. 
So let's see, so I'm going to translate this in the negative x direction to give a little uh, more room, uh, space for my, uh, my square to breathe there. So, so basically, do a translate. If I want to do a one-liner, then I don't need to put in curly braces, but it's probably better style to leave curly braces in there. So I, I just uh, shove that circle left to the left to tab. Does that make sense? So, so, so the circle's origin is actually now uh, off to the left. If you, uh, if you put a hash sign, so, so comments look like the, the syntax is pretty much C++. Uh, hash sign uh, highlights this geometry. Does that make sense? So you know, the circle is getting subtracted from the rest of it. So I can't, you know, it's not easy for me to see what the circle is to start with. Uh, and I, uh, uh, you know, want to especially uh, fairly common that uh, I'm trying to move the holes around and they're gone. And I'm like, oh, where, where'd they go? Uh, so, so, uh, so put a hash sign in there, and then it, it just draws the. So, so uh, th that object is not really part of the shape, but it's uh, but it's going to get drawn. So, d does that make sense? So, translate is a primitive. Scale is a primitive. Difference. Uh, I, I have these sort of language primitives that uh, uh, operate on shapes. Uh, so, so, in particular, what we what we've been constructing here is a two D shape, right? And it's the difference of a square and a circle. Uh, I can extrude that thing up into a 3D, so I'm going to do a linear extrude operation. So that's going to be, it, take a, it takes a height parameter saying, so, so this is happening all in the x, y plane, and I'm going to extrude that thing up into z, so this is, so height, height, uh, I don't know, so I'm going to uh, extrude by four millimeters. This is a really tiny object, but uh, do, do that, and, and you can see that now suddenly we have this three-dimensional <coughs> shape, which is kind of cool. And, and of course, you can, you can still translate you know, difference, uh, you have a union, you have intersection, you have scale, etc. on 3D shapes as well. Uh, so, so now, for example, I can take that linear extrusion, so I've got this weird little, I don't know what it is, so, so, so say this is some bracket that goes on my 3D printer, well, I need to bolt it onto the printer. So I need a bolt hole. Now, in most CAD programs, it's actually somewhat difficult, uh, especially if I've got two weirdly shaped objects, and just like put a hole through it. And, and in particular, uh, I often find this a little bit frustrating because in the uh, uh, if I had printed the thing out and I want to make a hole somewhere, I just stick the thing into the drill press and I just drop the drill bit into it, right? I was just, I was just <laughs> thinking that you know with traditional CAD programs you're looking more at subtractive manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Putting a hole thing into something should be one of the most basic operations out there. So a, a lot of classic CAD programs involve doing sketches, right? So that's a 2D shape. And then I'm going to you know pad it or pocket it into three dimensions, right? So I'm going to basically yeah, could come come out or, or come in. Uh, so 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 here it's it's a little bit interesting that uh, you, you you can do the same thing. I mean I can start with two D shapes, uh, but it's actually a little more common to get pretty free form in OpenSCAD and do uh, full three dimensional type operations. So in this case, if I want to uh, subtract a bolt hole, so let me do a difference. So. Difference is going to take uh, one, one parameter. First parameter for the difference is the thing that I'm going to start with. And if, if I just run it here, so it's a difference of a linear extrude with nothing. Right. Uh, so yeah? Could you like, assign the entire opportunity to make a snap object, like a variable or a function? <sighs> yeah, so, we'll, so we'll, we'll see how to structure this in a reasonable way in, in a stack. Yeah, and, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's uh, something a little bit weird about the way they did it, but, uh, but it, it, uh, it, it, it definitely can be done. So let's see, so I'm, I'm doing a difference between this weird bracket object and uh, a cylinder. So my, my cylinder, so you, you set the, uh, I can set the radius or diameter of the cylinder. So I, I probably should have used diameter. Somehow diameter feels more natural to me. Uh, so I uh, see some uh, diameter is going to be like uh, five millimeters because that's the, uh, uh, I call it, uh, Let's put an M3 bolt on there. That's a, that's a, that's a real thing. And uh, my height is going to be 10, so it's going to be a 10 millimeter long uh, uh, diameter 3 bolt. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preview this, and uh, where's, where's my bolt? And in particular, which direction is my difference geometry facing? So this is where the debug of putting a hash in actually makes your life a lot easier. So I'm going to put the hash in and then realize, okay, two things. <laughs> Right. One is that uh, an, M3, an M3 bolt is a tiny bolt. I think it's a bedrock M3 bolt. Uh, just so you can see what it is. Uh, an, an M3 bolt is like the smallest bolt known to man, right? It's basically like, uh, you know, it's... Uh, like I have uh, a zoom. Uh, a lot of 3D printers are, you know, they're made with M M3 bolts. Uh, what that is. Uh, so, you know, it's... Uh, you can see my, my fingertips, like, huge. Uh, 
it's not a lot of bolt <coughs> meaning this is and this is super duper common I, I, I'll, I'll do cat a lot and then as soon as I drop on the first actual dimension object I realize like ooh right this this needs to be way 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 bigger so luckily this whole thing is parametric right so size should be 20 of course there we go okay right and uh, maybe my height should be like uh, you know uh, 10 or something so okay so I've got a reasonable size object okay that's that's big enough to actually like bolt on to something okay now, now when I translate maybe I gotta beef that up actually maybe my translation should be proportional to size so you can you can figure out exactly how much of that you, you want to do Right. So, so now, now maybe I can, you know, just just ch check how this thing scales. Right? It's uh, something a little funny on the uh, on the sizes there. I guess it's a little bit weird that the the height is height is not scaling too. So, heck, I'll make I'll make it all parametric. So size. So uh, fully parametric means like uh, all of your dimensions are derived from some simple constant or something. Here's just a scale factor that's not quite as cool. Uh, so I, I, ideally, for example, uh, if I've got a bracket, I want uh, you know the size of the thing I need to bolt on. Right? So, so if I'm trying to bolt a camera on, for example, uh, then I'd have you know the dimensions of the camera would be the parameters. I'm going to figure everything out from there and figure out you know how, how big the bolt should be, etc. So okay, so we've got uh, see we have our little our little shape defined there. I'm going to, uh, okay, I think that's close to the original uh, uh, parameters. So what I want to do is I, I, I want, uh, I want so by default, cylinders are facing up along the z-axis. By default, my extrusions are along the z-axis. Uh, and if I want to bolt it on, I actually need the bolt going the other way. So what I'm going to do here is a rotation. So again, rotate is a primitive. And... Uh, so language primitives, is, and, and it works just like the control structures in a normal kind of language. So this is the uh, this is the rotations along the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. So if I uh, and they're measured in degrees, which actually makes them easy to just write down. So let's see. So if I rotate at 90 degrees, this is the, so this is the x-axis. If I do a right-hand rotation along the x-axis by 90 degrees, it flops down. Okay, that's not the axis I wanted. So uh, what I what I want I think is a minus 90 degree rotation along the y axis. Make that a positive 90 degree rotation along the y axis. Why is it okay? Uh, there's the y axis. We do a right handed rotation. That's positive 90. Okay. So we're uh, so, so we have the, the rotation is basically in the uh, uh, in the right direction. So okay. So that's that's cool. So now what uh, what I need to do is I need to translate this this hole up. So it's you know lines up uh, uh, in here. So I'm just going to do that uh, now. The question is, uh, do I want to do this before the rotation or after the rotation? In terms of the order I put these statements in. So I translate then rotate or rotate then translate. Rotate, translate. <laughs> well, so. W w weird part about this is if, if I do like a translate along the x-axis here, so I'm going to go like uh, 10 millimeters along the x-axis. So, the, so here the, the, uh, the hard brackets are the, the way you define a vector. So uh, we, that's, that's not, this is the x-axis. But the thing is we just rotated everything by 90 degrees. So this is the x-axis in the, like relative to the cylinder, that's the x-axis. So if I rotate first, that actually rotates my whole coordinate system, and I do translations, those are relative to my rotated coordinate system. Yeah, so, so this translate is happening like in object space. If I wanted a world space uh, translation, then I would do the translate first, and then the rotate. Does that make sense? Th this is one of the hardest things to get right in most programs. Right? In, in particular, uh, I, I actually really, so, so you know, if this translated in world space down the world x coordinate, which is the cylinder z, so picking picking the right one is uh, is, is hard. Uh, does that make sense? Uh, so in most in most CAD programs, somewhere you've got like a properties panel, right? And you look at the properties panel. It says the object's rotation is this some combination of things in radians or something. Usually, uh, its its translation is this. That translate. So the question is, did did it rotate and then translate, or did it translate then rotate? And oftentimes, uh, in, in a complicated part, you want, 
First, I want to translate from world, er, like world origin to robot origin, from robot origin to part origin, from part origin to, to feature origin, and this, you know, this maybe some rotations involved in several of those. And then finally, once I'm in there, then I do translations uh, relative to that. Right now, the managing coordinate system is like that's the battle for uh, uh, for for big complex parts. So, uh, we, we, so we, we, we got translations, so we're just nicking the corner of the thing now. So I, uh, I should actually be being parametric here. So this should be size times, uh, what, three quarters? Uh, seven, five, uh, see, the height, the height should actually be, let's see, my, my original height. Now, this is a little bit weird because I'm not really sure what the height of this bracket should be. So I'm going to have the uh, bracket height, make, make a new parameter. So it's going to be size times 0.5. And uh, I, I should uh, somehow it feels right to do to declare this up here. It doesn't matter the order you declare things in; it'll look them up when it has to, and uh, and 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 drive them all. So let's see. So in my world Z, I want to shift this thing by bracket, so half the bracket height. So this thing will should show up in the middle. Okay, so we're in the middle, and then I want to move inland a certain distance. I guess that's size relative. So uh, I'm going to move a quarter of the object's distance in, and. Uh, this immediately tells me that, uh, so this should be like 0.5 or something. Okay, so uh, y you can see there's a couple of weird things here. Do, 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 do you see what's happening with the... Uh, Ah, uh, yeah, so uh, when you press F5, you're getting a preview. The preview is actually done with some really clever OpenGL constructed cell geometry. It actually doesn't compute doesn't compute any of the triangles of the shapes you're interested in. It actually just, it, it's doing all the stuff on the screen. Now, uh, th this this hack, so the, 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 there's, there's sort of this wacky little hack that it does. Uh, to do that, it needs to know how many, how many times the shape is going to cross over. Uh, so so if, if you, uh, if you press F6, uh, it, it uses the computational geometry algorithms library, CGAL, and, and that, uh, that computes an actual polygon mesh. So this is the sort of real polygon shape. This is what get, would get dumped out to an STL file. Right? This, this is what it would print. Uh, but uh, uh, for, big, for big shape, F6 takes a stupidly long time. So F5 is really quick. Now the quick and dirty approximation here, uh, it's, uh, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit weird. Uh, so the problem here is this linear extrude is actually, right, 20 pixels are getting hit by this more than twice. It's not a convex shape. So you can actually specify in your linear extrude what you want the convexity to be. It only affects the display. It doesn't actually affect the finished rendered, you know, the, uh, the actual triangles. But it, it, it so, so, you know, you could set convexity to like 400 or something and then, uh, I guess I, my, my, my 1070 can handle it, but uh, on, a, on a lesser graphics card, that, that starts to slow things down. Uh, so uh, if, I, if I say convexity is forward, it actually just it does more passes, and that, that gets all the more geometry. Yeah? So on something more complicated, like the model of your head page or something, yeah. how does the uh, polygon preview uh, perform? Uh, it, it actually performs surprisingly good, so uh, we, should, we should do that. So let's see, so I'm going to just drop in, so import. We'll pull in an STL file, and uh, I think I called it that. So that's that's my head. There it is. Uh, that's that's cool. And uh, you can see clearly if we're gonna bolt this thing onto my head, it's got to be way bigger. So this is where parametric really helps. So I'm gonna make this bracket is now 200. We'll see what what sins did we inflict. Okay, we still have this tiny little M3 bolt. Uh, well, that's uh, that's kind of tiny. So let's see. So yeah, I, I guess we could upgrade the bolt or downscale my head. Now, if this is going to go onto my actual head, then you're just stuck with the scale that uh, that it is. Like I think this is the I think this is the actual size. So so uh, it, uh, obvious question: How do you bring in real world objects, right? And there's in, in the cases like I have my actual physical head that I've scanned here. Uh, but there's you know uh, lots of physical objects that you want to be able to get into your model, right? Uh, so how how do you do that? Have you done this? Well, it looks like it's approximated using a lot of triangles. Yeah. Well, so so uh, STL. I mean that's uh, stereo lithography format. Uh, but basically, uh, stupid triangle list is my favorite sort of. Uh, <laughs> it's, that's a backronym for the, uh, the the file name. I mean STL just has triangles. That's all it's got. 
So, yep, that's, uh, that's, that's what we got. This is actually a fairly smallish number of polygons. So you can see it's kind of low poly, kind of like uh, Star Fox enemy or something. Uh, so, uh, yeah, surprisingly enough, and, and to me this is where OpenSCAD really shines, right? Uh, I can actually do constructive cell geometry on, like, my head. So, for example, uh, you, you can see we've got this whole bracket. Uh, I can do a difference between my head and the bracket. And uh, I guess, uh, let's see, so I would have to translate the bracket. So I want to translate this thing left by about uh, size to make it to make it line up. And you can see it's actually, like, blasted a hole. And, uh, yeah, so in, in theory... In theory, the hole should actually be the exact shape of that bracket. It's kind of hard to tell. Ah, y y yeah, so y you can see performance is actually really great. Now, uh, what, what's that? That's, that's, that? that's a display bug because my head is not convex, not quite. So I set convexity there to convexity. So the display bug is gone. And uh, I can press F6 here, and uh, you can see here where it... Uh, it looked like some sort of error popped up there briefly. Oh, oh, assertion violation. That's uh, that's always scary. Yeah, and it didn't didn't it didn't actually work. Uh, I, actually, I'm pretty sure what happened here was the uh, we had one of the faces. So, so <coughs> it, it, it certainly is possible to run into big problems if you have. Uh, uh, like geometry exactly matches up here, and we, we were we were not real careful about that. It, it, it seems like it, it gets much worse once you have a big complicated model. That's where all your skins uh, are, are counted for. Ah, uh, that's uh, that can be kind of annoying. I, I'm going to try just randomly shifting this a little bit. See if that, okay, yeah, that uh, that worked on screen. Let me see if Seagal can figure it out. No, Seagal failed. Hard. It was just working this morning. Ah. <laughs> I I've, I've actually yeah. Huh. It's, it's, it's possible that something, so, so uh, you can certainly run to pro actually, uh, you can see the like z-buffer fighting, so let me drop out, uh, so the, if, if the head is gone, I just comment it out. Uh, the, 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 there can certainly be cases where you get z-buffer fighting, I guess we saw, we saw some of that, uh, basically two objects in the same exact spot can make things blow up, so that, uh, yeah, I, I've, I've seen that cause, cause seagull problems, and, and in importing big STL Seems like it breaks everything. It actually, this uh, a scan. A scan is actually really hard to make it be totally uh, closed. The closed kind of shape that you need to do uh, uh, 3D geometry. Ah, uh, yeah, that's. Uh, so. Uh, this is this is starting to get pretty dang unmaintainable. Right? So once you've indented more than about three or four times, it starts to look pretty, pretty wacky. So uh, to be a real programming language, it does feel like one one thing you really need is the ability to name objects. So in particular, we can we can name constants, you know, in, in exactly like this. Uh, you can uh, you can in fact uh, you can name you can name lots of different stuff. Like uh, this is the uh, the bracket location. So. So, so this translate, for example, sets the like origin of the bracket. So I can just, I, I can, I can declare this vector as a, uh, uh, you know, that's just a named variable. So, so basically, and anywhere where you're passing in a whole list of things, you can just, uh, you know, you can, you could break off each of the x, y, z's and give them names. You could then take that whole 3D vector and put that in a, uh, you know, give, give that a name. So here, here's the constant. That's the, this is like the point where we're starting the, uh, uh, you know, start starting the. Uh, the origin of that thing, and then I can also take that and uh, you know I can I can add two 3D vectors together. So if I want to bump this thing up along Y by 50 uh, millimeters, and I can totally do that. So you can see I just shifted the whole uh, the, the whole thing got uh, just got bumped there. So, so uh, <coughs> for some reason th they decided that uh, it was important to have this clear separation between values that be you know constants like floats, uh, vectors, etc. And geometry, like like you can see, geometry lives in like the curly braces world. Geometry kind of plays the role of code in a, a normal programming language, right? So I can, in, in particular, like uh, I've got geometry, like you know these circles or squares or the you know the linear extrusion or whatever, right? So, so you can see all this stuff is kind of uh, it's it's like code. So uh, 
th there's, there's sort of two kinds of functions, or what would be normally considered functions. So a, a function operates on values. So if I want to define like, uh, uh, it defines some of my measurements in inches, for example, I can define a function inches. So it takes a variable and it's just going to return uh, the millimeter version of that. So I can say, well, my size is now going to be inches of eight and that uh, should do the right thing. So that, that uh, it's like basically uh, eight, uh, eight, eight inches. So th this again, just operates on values, right? Values come in, values go out. I can't do any geometry inside of a function. Uh, the, the, the way you do, uh, ge so the way you package up geometry is, uh, is in modules. So I can define a module, and this is the bracket, for example. So uh, I can take a list of values, and uh, those would be you know, like my parameters. So here, so, so this, this definitely makes things a lot nicer. Oh my gosh. I was just trying to tab. So, uh, so the, the you know, making a bracket. Well, I translated the origin of the bracket. The difference between this 2D shape and then the, uh, the mounting hole that I feel like I have not uh, quite finished up. Uh, and, then, and then now I can do difference between some geometry and my bracket. So if you do difference between geometry and the bracket, then I guess uh, difference of the bracket, and then I don't have anything uh, to take the difference of. So, so, so uh, being able to name like chunks of geometry is super important for you know, building complicated objects. So how am I going too fast here? Seeing some stunned silence. Yeah. Well, I I really wish many of these things were more standard than they seem to be. So, for example, uh, if I'm if I'm in SolidWorks, right, uh, I can name a part, but a part tends to get really ridiculously complicated. As far as I can tell, I can't like uh, maybe, maybe there's some way to like name a subpart, but then I can't refer to subparts by name. Uh, it has the ability to like replicate parts, but then if I want to say like take this part and just stick another ad hoc copy here, here, there, and maybe somewhere else in the future. I don't know of a way to like copy paste like you know uh, in particular uh, what you want to do for complicated objects is you want to be able to like name subroutines right so you want to say yeah I got this little bracket motif and that worked really great over here so I'm just going to call that like bracket module from over here and then I'm going to rotate and translate and stick another bracket on over here and then do stick another one on over here to fix it and being able to replicate uh, locations seems to be you know this is a huge hugely important thing. Uh, makes makes your life a, a lot easier. So I can I can do a bracket. So let's see. So my, my bracket got really huge because we were cons considering my head. Uh, let's see. So what's uh? You know, having you know, I, I don't know if your wife had any big bolts stuck in your neck. The just M3s. They're not that big. Yeah, so I'm saying that's why you're not feeling the bolts. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, see, so if, we, if, if we've got this tiny little, uh, so if we consider back to like mounting a bracket on a robot, which is probably more morally sound. So let's see, so we've got, uh, so, so in particular, like uh, what is this cylinder representing, right? That cylinder is really representing an M3 bolt. So I'm gonna call this uh, module. There's my M3 bolt. And, uh, and then you realize like this height, uh, the height is actually the length of the bolt. So I can so I can just drop that thing in there. So there's just and, and this is often how I make functions in other languages or modules in OpenSCAD is I, I start by writing one giant unmaintainable ball of crap and then I as soon as I realize like this is getting unmaintainable, I chop out subsections and make those into little submodules. And then uh, and, and oftentimes naming them you realize, hey, that height of ten, that is not a constant of the universe, that's the bolt length. And I can either make bolt length like a global parameter, or I can make it a parameter for this module. So bolt length, maybe I have a default of whatever, whatever however long you're, you know, you have a box of bolts somewhere. If most of them are M10, or the M3 by 10s, then you set bolt length to 10 as the default. So, so now if I call M3 bolt without parameters, then uh, it's going to be 10 millimeters, right? That's the reason my origin got messed up here. Actually, so figuring out the origin point for rotation, and uh, I bet you there's some reset. Uh, gosh, so yeah. I uh, oh, translated the bracket way off. Yeah, yeah like 50. Okay. Or you have a situation where it automatically, you know, you tell it the this object is a bolt, 
and as you translate the, the surrounding thing, it automatically adjusts that so that it is always a valid both sides. So you have a chart. It's yes, yes, yes. So uh, it's the, the, the variety of really beautiful things you can do in OpenSketch. And uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've got some really awesome examples. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to trying to work my way up slowly. Uh, so uh, in particular, uh, M3 Bolt has there, there's there's a couple of geometric features on this thing that uh, we didn't we didn't really talk about. So the, the bolt has this little hex head, right? It's actually it's not even hex; it's a round. It's like a socket head. And uh, so so, so the, the shaft is three millimeters. So that's the you know sort of the default size. But in particular, if if I want to uh, if I want to have this thing facing against this curved surface, the, cu the curve is really bad, right? But uh, the curve is going to mean when I when I screw this thing down, it's going to contact first on the outside of the curve, and then because it's curving away, like it's not, you know, that's that's not going to work you're, you're very well. So I can do the following. Uh, the the it turns out the little socket is six millimeters in diameter. The height is uh, I forget what the height is. Yeah, call it three, I guess. Or actually the the bolt is going to have to get inserted, so I think I am going to just hard code a little constant there. So I, I'm going to say, so this is the this is the cap on the uh, on, on the bolt head. Now what I want is I want this thing. It should be facing the same direction as the bolt, basically. It should be going the other way though. So if I just if I draw this by default, you can see it's kind of overlapping the bolt head. So wh what I want is I want the bolt origin should be right where the bolt is tightened up against something, right? In other words, that's that's where I want the origin to be. And then uh, I, I want the sort of shaft of the bolt is facing in the plus z direction, and then I want this cylinder facing the minus z direction. How how would I do that? So so this cap I got to flip it around so it's facing the right way. Yeah, so I can I can rotate it by uh, 180 so that's facing the opposite direction. Hopefully, so let's see if that works. Okay, it. Uh, I guess this this does depend on if I want to. So, so to illustrate like what it's supposed to look like, right? That's probably about the shape. I don't know if these dimensions are right. So, uh, so, so in particular, oftentimes you've got real world physical objects here, and I want to be able to print it. Now, I want to make sure the hole that I print is big enough for the head to actually fit in. So. You have to increase it by some margin. Well, I, in particular, I'm not really sure physically how big this is. Like somewhere you can download a spec for this, and somewhere it's got a drawing. But then in the reality, may not. All right. So, uh, so, so th this set of calipers, <laughs> these are these are really really useful. <laughs> this is this is actually like among the most useful tools. So let's see. So uh, I don't know how to show this to you. So let's see. So I'm gonna power. Uh, let's see. So that's power on is the first thing. Uh, first thing I want to do is make sure it's set to the right units, which is millimeters in this case. I'm going to close the calipers and then verify that the thing is zero, because uh, if it's not, that's nothing, nothing's going to work from that point. And then basically, like using these things a little bit, like M MEs certainly hopefully know exactly how to use these things, but uh, ideally you'd be really gentle. And, and this is A because it's kind of a, you know, it's a precision piece. And uh, is it visible at all? It's probably not visible at all. Uh, so, so basically, I'm just you know I can I can read off the dimensions and it's 5.6 millimeters. So, uh, two two ways to do this, right? Well, one is I can say uh, the diameter of the cap is exactly 5.6 millimeters. Now that's that's cool, right? Uh, and uh, I can check the thickness on it too. The thickness is indeed three. Uh, so, uh, what, what what this means? 5.6. So uh, that, that's about the actual size of the thing. It means that your uh, opening for the bulkhead is probably going to end up being too small because your printer yeah. is not 100% accurate. Yeah. Uh, there may be carries with screws, so you might want to go a little bit larger. So this is this is one of these weird cases. If I've got a, like a really tight, super precise printer, I've got like a you know uses laser beams or something to uh, uh, cure resin instead of just like uh, toothpasting like molten plastic out all over the place. Then maybe maybe like you know this uh, you know I've got like a fraction of a I've got like uh, 05 millimeters of slack there anyway right I mean like a twentieth of a millimeter should be plenty. it's plastic it's, it's an Allen wrench you'll just cork it in. <laughs> you know yeah. it, it, it's metal it'll but move the plastic out of the way the other thing I've done a lot actually if uh, if I want to make sure this hole is like really precise I will make it two millimeters in diameter even though I want it to end up being three so it's just going to moosh way too much plastic in there. And I'll take a three millimeter drill bit or a three millimeter ream 
and I'll make it exactly the right size after the fact. So it's a combination of additive and subtractive. Because right? uh, uh, actually, I have to say, like you know, at least on all my printers, if I if I moosh the plastic around a hole, it's not nearly as precise as if I drill a you know this nice smooth chunk of hardened steel. Like it's it's going to be a much uh, a much better looking shape. So, so uh, y y your choice on these things. Actually, uh, uh, one thing I add a lot is you just add a parameter. So this is the amount of slop in your printer, and that can again either be a global or local. So the slop is 0 0.5, meaning like I really want it to go in. Like at, at least half a millimeter of slop is what I want to add to these things. So I'm going to add, so and, and then you can just, you know, computationally just add that to the diameters of these things. I guess it's diameter slop. M maybe that should be two times slop. It totally depends on what uh, how you want to define slop. Uh, you know, the size of the hold Yeah, again, totally depends on what you're after. If if what you, if, if if I've got 150 holes that I don't want to have to drill out, but I want the bolts to definitely fit through, I just make the holes too big, and then the, you know it's going to rattle around a bit. But there's a lot of you know, uh, uh, it's, like, yeah. it's not going anywhere. It's going to be fine. Uh, but but if uh, if I've literally got like one screw, one screw is awful, by the way. Like uh, the part, of the bracket is going to like want it's going to rotate around that one screw. Like uh, two two screws, kind of your generally speaking, your minimum. Uh, so uh, put put put, uh, put put your bolts in there. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So I, I I would actually yeah I'd use negative slop if I wanted to. And and you know you can you can totally override this on a per bolt basis, right? So this particular bolt. So so this is the other kind of surprising thing. Uh, you, you notice I've named the parameters and given them default values. The names are used both on the call side and the caller side. So if, if I give it two parameters, it's like ordered parameters. So as I say, bolt length of 12 and uh, slop of 0 0.5, then I can you know, I can just pass in two parameters and that, that, that thing should have got, gotten longer. Uh, or I can just I can override slop equals. Uh, so let me make a five millimeter slop. That's way too much slop. But that's, that's enough now. Like uh, the head is in danger of falling through the hole. So. Okay, that would be something like, so let's say, rather than in an outer wrench, and you have a uh, socket type head where mm. you need to You may need lots tool. of clearance. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and uh, so, so the other thing I'm a little bit concerned about is uh, the, the height is so. I've certainly heard of the cases where the, uh, the hole for the bolt is exactly the size of the bolt, which is great. There's enough space for the bolt to fit in there. It's just that uh, the the cap of the bolt has been like walled over by plastic, so there's no way to stick the bolt in, right? If it was in there already, or if like during the print I dropped it in, we all would have been fine. But uh, I didn't I didn't do that, so you know uh, it was messed up. So that's where you get a felt cap and uh, screw. So so the question is how how much space do I need to insert? Uh, so so I'm gonna, I'm gonna slide this cap uh, bolt in like uh, you know from from that direction. So insert maybe I need uh, like uh, the bolt length at least. So we call it uh, call it ten. So I'm, I'm gonna make this cap an extra insert big. So this is again just the space I'm clearing out of the part. So so this makes sure that nothing is getting in the way there. Uh, and if, if my bracket gets more and more complicated, then eventually this is gonna hit some other thing, and that'll remind me that oh, to to cram the bolt in there, you're gonna need to make space to cram the bolt in there. I, I guess I'm, I'm also assuming there's, there's some way to get the bolt uh, into this position. <laughs> it, it, it depends too. Like, uh, it, in fact, sometimes yeah, like the, the assembly path, like, and then I gotta have a tip in a bottle. Yeah, spa space for it. So you know, you drop the screw in there, and it goes through some wacky spiral passageway because it's you know it's avoiding all the crucial stuff it needs to do. It falls in the right spot, and there's one little hole <coughs> where you stick your Allen wrench down to tighten it down. I mean, you can you can be really fancy if you want. So uh, there's my bolt head. You notice it's not it's not actually going to tighten down against anything. So I just need to move where the move the starting point. So which axis was the? I think uh, I think it's still x. So I'm I'm going to just uh, I'm, I'm I'm moving it parametrically. It's a little bit a little bit weird, but uh, but probably okay. So okay. So I've, I've got that thing basically in there. It's gonna it's gonna sit m more or less flush. I mean, I think that's uh, that's probably okay. So I, I can I can now see that if I used a you know 10 millimeter long uh, bolt, then that's how much I'm gonna have facing. Maybe that's not quite enough for me to get the nut on the far side or to cap it into you know whatever I'm uh, uh, passing into. So so you, you can so uh, bottom line, you can you can combine real parts 
and uh, and you know pull measurements off of real objects to figure out exactly how stuff is supposed to go together. Yeah, make sense. So uh, let me. So, so this was just a random quote unquote bracket for some object. I don't know what it is exactly. So I'm gonna do. Let, let, let's do an actual honest to goodness design. So I'm gonna uh, just give it a new name and. Uh, I'm gonna get rid of basically everything here. So, uh, so, so to start off with, uh, the thing I want to model. Oh, and I should, I should. Uh, the one thing I wanted to keep was my M3 bolt because that uh, that worked pretty good. So I'm I'm going to figure out hopefully how to get my M3 bolts in there. And I I don't think I used any of the rest of this stuff. Uh, one. Uh, so, so if I press F5, what do I get now? I get nothing because I said there's a module to be able to make M3 bolts, sort of like de you know defining a function but not calling it. How do I how do I actually make myself a bolt? Gotta call bolt, and then then there's a bolt. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, what I like to design is I like to design a bracket to fit uh, a stepper motor. So th this is this is sort of the key motor in most 3D printers, etc. Uh, so so this is this is actually a really handy part to kind of have in your toolbox of things that you might want to use. Uh, there 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 are all sorts of different sizes. Uh, uh, particularly the face, it, there's there's a standardized NEMA face, although the depth the depth doesn't seem to be terrifically standard. So. Uh, I could look up the, you know, somewhere there's a drawing that tells you exactly how big a NEMA, I think this is a NEMA 17, uh, might be a 23, but I, yeah. So, uh, so, so again, I, all I'm going to do is use my calipers. So this thing is basically a box, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm going to say, so what I want is I want basically the outside diameter to start with. So that turns out to be basically, well, so this is 41.97, which, which means 42, right? So I'm, I'm going to have the, uh, so this is, and I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, do this from the get-go. So here's a NEMA stepper face. So uh, I'm going to start off make, making a 2D shape for the uh, uh, the outline of the thing. So it's basically a square, and uh, the side side length is 42. Uh, if I declare variables inside here, uh, th these are these are now local variables. So those those aren't going to go weird places. So. You cannot override them externally because they're local, which uh, which is good. But uh, we'll see. So so I so I, I got to figure out the, the right coordinate system for this stepper. And I think the natural coordinate system for the stepper puts the origin right in the middle of the stepper. So m my square by default has the origin is down here in the corner, right? And uh, it's actually uh, so for some reason circles have their origin at the origin, right? The center center of the origin. Uh, Two two ways to do this. I can do a translate, and uh, I translate by minus half the side uh, on both directions. So uh, side is what I should have done. There. So totally doable. So, so now you can see the thing is centered. So that's that's good. Uh, and uh, there's a there's another way to do this though, which is uh, you can just say translate side side center. So there's there's again this optional parameter called center in the square module that basically centers. Uh, th there are times I want to center in x but not in y, and to do that you just translate. Basically. Uh, so okay, so so uh, I don't know if you can see the out the outline of this thing is not quite no, it's not quite a square, right? It's it's got these rounded corners. So you know if uh, so. so you could ignore these, and you could have like a hole or a bracket that extends out that whole way. But you know, if, uh, if we want, if we're doing this, let's let's do this. So basically, I'm just going to grab the uh, the outside dimension there, which turns out to be exactly 50, like 0. 0.00. That uh <laughs> so okay, that, that that's cool. Now, now the question is, what uh, what kind of shape is this? So is is this a is this a flat bevel or is this a rounded? Uh, looks like it. Uh, looks rounded. Yeah. So, uh, so, so, so the circle in particular has a radius of or a diameter of fifty. So that's that's kind of cool. So I can actually just do an intersection between a square and a circle of diameter is fifty. And it's it's probably okay to like not name this because I don't I don't think I'm ever going to use that particular circle again. So okay. So that's so we get the outline pretty much right there. 
It says, does this look, uh, does it look plausible? Yeah. I always, uh, it's, it's, it starts to get hard to tell. Okay, and now we've got, uh, uh, we've got a big hole in the face, which is 20, I'm going to call it 22, it's rounding up slightly. So this is, uh, th th this is this little raised section, and that's for the, uh, uh, basically to really uh, index the, the center, uh, to provide mechanical support for the shaft. So that's a circle of diameter 22. What do we, we need to combine that with this existing thing. How do we do that? I want to stick in 2D for as long as I can. Actually, a million things are easier in 2D uh, and, and faster. So, 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 uh, so, so in particular, like if, if I'm going to do a bracket that's, that connects to a stepper, I actually probably want to leave this whole area clear, right? That that, that you know, uh, so, so so my plastic should probably just extend right up to that, and then you know, and and that way I don't I don't care what's on the shaft, and uh, if I put a thing on the shaft, then I can remove the this thing without taking whatever's on the shaft off the shaft. So if I if I bolt something you know on to the shaft, uh, if, if I have a big hole that uh, that makes my life easier, so I just I just want to uh, nuke a giant hole in my front plate. So this is just going to be a difference. The difference I'm just doing a subtraction operation between that circle and the, the stuff I had before. Uh, so I just uh, blasted a hole in there. Ah, uh, and then then we got these four little uh, four little screw holes. Now uh, th this is this is something where so, so, so you, you can see that we can get down to the like you know. Uh, th th this will read out to the tenth of a, uh, or to a hundredth of a millimeter, which is appallingly precise, right? And basically physical contact uh, uh, size. Now the problem is you can kind of like squint and you can kind of like hope, you can eyeball and try to line these things up. That turns out to be very error prone, and I've, I've screwed up more things doing that than uh, uh, anything else. Uh, w one, of the, uh, uh, one of the easiest ways to get a really uh, accurate measurement between two holes is just stick stuff in there. So, uh, so in, in, in this case, all, all I'm doing is I've, I've got, uh, I get these two nice little uh, uh, M M3 bolts. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the distance between the outsides of the bolts. And the uh, distance between the outsides of the bolts is 33.9. Uh, the diameter of the bolt head itself is uh, 2.9. The threads are kind of annoying, but the, the, these threads are, I don't know if you can see, the threads are tiny. <laughs> and and uh, the sort of outside of the thread forms like a pretty consistent cylinder. So I, I, I think I'm, I'm probably okay. So, so, so the question is, how far apart are the bolts? The bolts, the bolts. Uh, well, it's 33.9 minus uh, 2.9. Right, that, that, that's, that's the distance that I measured horizontally from one bolt to the next bolt. If that makes sense. Uh, or, yeah, let's see. So, uh, so w w what do I want to subtract in order to get to the uh, the center line of the bolt to the center line of the bolt? And uh, yeah, so so this is it's a little bit something to think about here. So what I measured was the outside of the outside. That includes the uh, so, so that that's from the center line of both uh, to the outside of both. So, so essentially, all, all I'm going to do is, uh, you know, it's just it's the outside distance minus the you know two halves, which is you know one whole bolt thickness, and and uh, you know s sometimes you can line things up better like trying to do this. So you're on the inside of one and you're measuring the outside of the other one. I guess uh, so that turns out to be like 30, 30.1. Actually, he, here here uh, the, the the sharp the sharp blade of this uh, uh, this measure is actually kind of I can feel it's like nested into the teeth. So that, that messes up your distances too. So, so if, if I can if I can keep the flaps a, against there, and the, the the other the other thing, and I just realized this myself, embarrassingly, if if I if I get a distance, okay, great, I get like you know thirty thirty three point uh, or something. If I now crank as hard as I can, I actually I I, I just lost 0 0.2 millimeters, and I lost 0 0.2 millimeters because a like the part is gonna flap. The calipers are going to flex. Like the amount of the amount of force you apply, 
and, and especially if you really you know, crank down on it, you can you can deform these things to much further than I would have expected. It, uh, it, it it's especially bad if you're so I, I've had cases where I'm milling on a part, so I have it in the milling vise, and of course when when you're milling on it, you're you know putting big forces on it, so you don't want it to get torn out of the milling vise. So you put it you put it in the vise, and you just crank the thing down as hard as you can into a vise. If you take measurements, the measurements are off. I mean, it's 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 weird. Uh, and in particular, then then you then you have to figure out like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna machine a hole of the wrong shape, so that when I take it out of the vise, it's gonna expand into the right shape. And that's that's important if you're down in the fractional millimeter. Uh, that's why they get the same shape. Yeah. Button, <laughs> yeah. So uh, both so hopefully this is the center point center point of the. Uh, 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 of, of this of this thing, so I think that comes up to 31, and you know, depending on how confident you are in your mental arithmetic, you could either do that or have the have the machine do it. So hopefully that's the bolt bolt distance. Ah, uh, so what I need to do is I need to do a translate and another translate to get out to the center point here to to start. So what I need to do is put in a M3 bolt hole basically, but uh, the same 2D I guess. Uh, I want to do a, a diameter three hole. And I need to translate out a certain distance. So how far? How far is that? Yeah, it's one half of bolt to bolt in each uh, along each axis. So half of bolt to bolt and half of bolt to bolt. So we do that. And uh, okay, so so we got one. So so the question is, uh, how close does that look? Does that look uh, plausible? You can you can see it's not. Uh, it's not like hanging out over the side. Uh, th th this this might be a little bit misleading because they they bored in a little bit of uh, lead into this hole. I mean the uh, I, I bet you if I measure the diameter of the hole, it's bigger than three. So yeah, three point two. So I, I I think this thing actually looks like uh, the uh, the geometry is a tad closer to the edge than ours. So yeah, uh, so th th there's good and bad things about the spec online. That a the spec online is going to be what it should be, which means if I order from a different company, it's more likely to be that than it is to be whatever I got from this particular vendor. Uh, the, the the advantage of measuring them yourself is that if you can't find the you know the uh, the official drawing, or if the part itself doesn't really match the official drawing, which happens uh, disturbingly often, uh, this is. Uh, uh, you know, so uh, me measuring parts yourself is definitely uh, uh, definitely a thing that well, okay. uh, is useful useful to have. Okay, so we've got uh, translation now. This is one bolt. I get four bolts. So again, I could just copy paste this three more times and then put in minus signs in appropriate places. That doesn't feel like the right way to do this. I could make a module and call the module four times. That's slightly better. Uh, I, I claim here what I actually want is I want to. Uh, a, a, for loop, a for loop would be great, and in particular, uh, for loops are supported. They've got kind of a weird range syntax. That it doesn't have the normal initializer uh, uh, stuff. So, so the range syntax, so I'm, I'm going to loop over angle, starts at zero, goes by 90 degree steps to 360 and to 359, I guess. So if, if I go to 360, it's inclusive, so I'm going to have a zero and then a 360. I, I don't need that. So uh, 90 degree steps, so that's like my angle plus equals 90 each time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna rotate uh, on the Z axis, I guess. But man, but there's, there's a lot of ways to do this. So we do that and we, we got our four. So this is this is fairly common. That's not a really bad way to do it. It's, uh, so so th this makes it really obvious how you would do like a, uh, uh, if I have a hex mount, you know, so there should be six uh, total. That's, that's running out of space for the square. So I'm just going to comment out the square so you can see. Like, you know, if you want to do a ring of six, then just doing 60 degree steps instead of doing, you know, 90 degree steps. So that's that's like the right the right way to do that. Uh, so this particular one has four copies. So I'm just going to do 90 degree steps. This is not the only way to do this. Uh, so we can do. We can do this. There's there's a lot of different ways. So I've I've done uh, four. Mirror X starts off at negative one, takes steps of two to positive one, 
And then I'm going to do is going to scale by mirror x. Does that make sense? So I'm going to scale by negative 1. That will flip everything about the x-axis. So I just mirrored it in the x direction. So again, it's just, just a for loop. I have a negative 1 copy. It takes a step size of 2. So it, uh, if you take a step size of 1, it, I guess then you have a zero size uh, weird version in there. And I can do the same thing in y and then just have uh, y. So I'm, I'm going to flip y negative. So totally, totally doable. Uh, you can even, I can make a module out of that. So, you, so this is all a module that spits out one shape. And it doesn't really take anything in except, you know, unless I want to put in some parameters. But you can actually have modules that, uh, that take geometry. So this would be like a quad symmetry. So if I define a module quad symmetry, and, and this, is, this is weird because... Uh, this is something that uh, C++ does not let you define new sort of control structures, right? In other words, if it takes curly braces or it takes, uh, I, I don't want the semicolon there, because uh, so, so what I want essentially is I want to pass this geometry to quad symmetry, and then I want to somehow call it here. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's it's very lambda like actually uh, uh, open like the the hardcore open SCAD gets really functional, yeah, uh, yeah and and for some reason like they treat like translate or rotate those are treated like functions right so to combine them it's uh, it's a little bit weird because uh, I mean oftentimes I'm thinking like I want to loop over an array of transform matrices and you, you don't do that here like uh, you know translate and rotate are considered functions. So what I want is I want to like uh, I take some concatenation of functions. You end up doing a lot of higher order programming type stuff. It's kind of beautiful. Uh, so quad symmetry. So, so how the the way I get to uh, all of the child geometry here is I just call children. This is a keyword, and that just that means instantiate all the stuff that's you know below me in the uh, in the hierarchy, and this should make my four copies. So that makes quad symmetry. And then, uh, yeah, so two quick questions about uh, So hopefully we just made the 2D outline of a, uh, you know, stepper motor. So, okay, cool. I claim we left out a couple of fairly crucial things. Uh, in particular, if I'm going to print a part, so, so for example, uh, here's this thing. I want to leave some slop. I didn't. I didn't leave slop in any of this. Um, yeah, that looks like the mouse. That looks like the mousey place. Uh, but you, you almost want that to be a negative, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, th th there's a ton I can do with it. So, for example, if I want to make a dummy stepper, so I want to 3D print a thing that's in the shape of a stepper, so I can check to see if a stepper is going to fit in this place I want it before I crack my old stepper. I just linear screw this. And it's got a hole all the way through. That's a little weird. But, but, you, but you know, if you're wanting something that you can mount to a stepper, yeah. but you more you common, I want to plug a stepper into somewhere, so, so that's the size of the hole. Actually, yeah. need to extend out. Yep. Yeah. Because you you want to have both holes. Yeah. Where the step where you're going to be putting it. <coughs> and uh, yeah, so, and so also you need to make so. sure that of course your uh, uh, axle has space. So I, I so I, I I got several things that I gotta I gotta fix here. So one that turns out to be super easy. So once I've defined this shape, if uh, if I want to now like drill a hole in something that will be the shape of all this stuff, so I can cram a stepper in, then uh, th then basically like I can I can actually just uh, make make however much space I need using so offset this beautiful built-in, uh, and, and it lets you just add a certain distance. So for example, if I want one millimeter of slop around the outside of this whole shape. So that, for example, now I can drill a hole in something or other, you know, and have have that shape and have enough space for the stepper to definitely fit. Then, uh, so, so it offsets super duper powerful because it, you know, it enlarges all directions of a 2D shape. So the uh, you can see basically the uh, all of the inside surfaces get smaller as all the outside surfaces get bigger. So in other words, it uh, you will still have slop even if. Uh, 
even if it's a complicated shape with non-convex areas. Uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, offset, offset can be misused for a bunch of wacky things. I, I end up really, I kind of like offset. Uh, so so we, we start off with offset zero. We start off with these hard corners right there. Right, and it's the intersection of a circle and a, a plane, and uh, you know that you might want to bevel that edge a little bit. M again, a grown-up CAD program has a built-in bevel operation. Open SCAD doesn't, uh, but what it does have is it has offset. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, I'm going to uh, let's see. This is this is going to get weird. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to offset in the negative direction by call it. Uh, so here's the fill it. So if I if I shrink stuff down, okay, that's down to the real core of the thing. Uh, these holes are really going to mess this process up. Uh, <laughs> so what I've just done is I've just shrunk it down and then inflated it again. So you can see this kind of rounds off all of the shapes, although the interior holes mess that up. Uh, so I can I can actually fix this by first blowing away the interior holes. So I'm going that to. Uh, that could actually be, still be a valid mounting thing with you know. Just down with the washer yeah, yeah, and uh, there, there are times when it's actually kind of nice to be able to get rid of that stuff. So, uh, so this this starts to get really weird. So I'm just basically offset positive and then negative. So let's look at these one at a time. So the positive offset basically makes the whole thing fatter and blows away interior holes, which we're destroying the rest of this. So why is the center hole filled? Ah, because it's uh, I only I only filled it so I only came in by four millimeters and it's like twenty millimeters across. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Get rid of holes, uh, I should say, get rid of holes is an operation called convex hull. This also works only, uh, uh, you know, this works for, convex hull works for 3D shapes, offset only works for 2D. So a uh, convex hull takes the, just the convex sort of closure of the shape. Uh, hull, hull is an amazing way to avoid the problem where uh, here was the stepper bracket, here was the, the like the drive gear bracket, and I want to just have a line tangent to both of those circles. It's like flashback to geometry class, and you're like, oh my god, the triangle. Uh, so it, it, you can you can do a ton of trig, you can do sines and cosines and stuff in here, and figure all of that out. It's actually super easy though if you just draw a circle, translate circle, convex hull, and then you have this nice little uh, shape around there. And and in general, actually. Uh, Combination of hulls, offsets, uh, fillets, man, this this makes uh, a, a million stuff, a uh, million pounds of things get a million times easier. For example, if I want to have the little uh, outline around the stepper, well, I start with the offset hull of the stepper, and then I subtract off the stepper without being offsetted or hulled. So. Looking weird. Does that, does that make sense? So, oh, I, I, I see. Maybe I want uh, offset hole stepper minus hole stepper. So there's no no holes involved. So, so uh, I can build I can build the outlines of things really cheaply if if I start in 2D. This is one reason I really prefer to start in 2D. So, so this the inside shape, the uh, the stepper motor ought to just drop directly into that. You say ah. It drops exactly into that? No, I need some wiggle room, so I'm going to add uh, half millimeter of wiggle room. So this is the, you know, the hole for the uh, for the stepper to drop into. And now that stepper will drop in there, and I have you know a programmable amount of wiggle room. And uh, and then if, if you decide to go in and switch steppers, all of this just automatically works, and you don't have to worry about like figuring out the geometry for each of the little you know edges of the thing, etc. Actually, uh, the 2D in particular, like offset, is Crazy, ridiculously powerful. Uh, I, I did uh, the the, uh, the the little uh, blue robot wheel that, uh, that we passed around. It has a million and one spokes, right? I mean, it's got like you know, uh, there's I think nine holes around the outside, and each hole has you know uh, four spokes or something. So there's like 27 separate pieces of geometry. Well, no, there's a for loop that just says like, yep, make the spokes, and you have a for loop that just drops in the spokes in the right, the right spot. I union them all together, so you got one big 2D outline. I then I then do the wacky like combo offsets thing to to round all of the corners of all of the intersections of the spokes, and automatically gets rid of the little hole in the middle. I should be showing this to you as I say it. Uh, uh, so see if. Uh, 
if I can find this. Uh, the one piece trash rocket. amount of code and this is this is true for many of uh, so, so this stuff tends to get real big so it starts off with like several screen folds of just parameters on like how big are your uh, how big are the holes how big are the uh, you know the drive bracket how much wiggle room so uh, I, the wiggle room is actually much smaller than it it, uh, it is in reality just because uh, I end up having to subtract the machine off uh, many of these things so uh, this the, the, the final part ends up being reason uh, still still rendering the final part ends up being pretty complex there so what I'm gonna do is uh, hopefully show this to you yeah it's uh, and, and and this is this is kind of the trick is uh, so here, here we, we load up this thing, and uh, gosh, even just loading the STL takes a while. So that's the. Uh, so y we, we, we've got a, a part like this, and uh, you can see the spokes, right? That there's just uh, arbitrary complexity in the spokes, and the uh, the wheel is going to break if this. It, it, it's going to break right at this sharp set right here corner between these two things. So all of all of these little inside corners need to get uh, rounded off in the cylinder, and uh, basically. In 3D, I usually have to like manually go in and do a second like constructor cell geometry pass to like carve out uh, the rounded, uh, roundedness. This is this is actually uh, this is something OpenSCAD doesn't do very well. Uh, you know, a, a grown-up CAD program again is going to be a lot better about uh, just like letting you click on an edge and say make this edge smooth. The, the problem then being that uh, once something else moves, it will not be able to find that edge again. So, so uh, it's uh, more user intuitive, but uh, less parametric. So th that's the hole where the bearing goes to actually take the you know the mechanical forces, and uh, and that, that usually gets subtracted or machined out. So so it's you know uh, mass is totally an issue. So there's a whole lot of like uh, you know honeycombing and stuff that I, I'm doing manually for some reason. This is still trying to think about how to draw this. I, I th oh, uh, come to think of it, th this is this is where uh, I, I just hit these random magic parameters to like crank down the, uh, the resolution when I'm when I'm uh, when I'm trying to debug and test. Okay. So, uh, right. so uh, t t it, it turns out two two D is really really powerful. In fact, uh, this is this is something where you know I, I can I can get stuff done in just a little tiny bit of code that. I don't know how to do in most other programs. Uh, in particular, uh, 2D was a bizarre combination of offsets. Uh, so here, for example, uh, so we, we've just done this thing. If you want to round all of these edges, I mean, it's, it's sort of a weird notion, right? Uh, the, the, the way I round an outside corner is I inflate it, and it gets rounder, right? And, uh, and then, okay, that, that's cool. If I deflate it, it gets sharp again, which is not necessarily what I want. So uh, wh what I do is if I take an inside corner and I inflate it, nothing happens. And then I deflate and it rounds out. It, it erode away. Uh, an outside corner, if I want to make it round, I shrink it and then fatten it up again and it rounds as it inflates. So the standard way to just round all sides of the object is to do this wacky operation that I inflate everything, deflate everything, deflate everything again past where it was inflated, and then inflate again. This unfortunately will, uh, uh, holes that you had smaller than, you know, or features that were smaller than four may be gone by this point. It may glue stuff together. But uh, it, for places where it works, this basically like auto, you know, rounds off everything to be rounded. And then, then you just set the uh, set the diameter that you want, uh, you want to be rounded to. Uh, oh. So, so, for example, why do I have no object? <laughs> well, I was. I started off trying to get these walls. 
and my walls were only you know four millimeters thick to start with except they have a half millimeter wiggle room so the walls are 3.5 millimeters thick and then I fattened them that's okay now they're 7.5 millimeters thick now they're back to 3.5 millimeters thick then I shrink them they are negative 0.5 millimeters thick meaning they're gone and then there's nothing to fatten yeah so uh, the, the, the one downside with this is that uh, your geometry has to be bigger than whatever your size you're building. So, so here, if, uh, if I want to make a giant fat 3 millimeter uh, block around, around stuff, then I should be able to... Yeah, I would think that would work. Come on. There we go. So I can, I, I can round uh, the outside corners, and you can see that in the nice, uh, nice rounding effect there. So, so uh, it's it's kind of annoying. Offset only works for 2D shapes, and it's kind of problematic there. Uh, it, it'd be really cool if there's like an auto, you know, smooth the edges of things. Because that's if, if, as far as uh, if I want to pick up an object and not have the sharp corners cutting into my hands, I'm going to round all the outside corners. Uh, if if I'm applying stresses to the thing, sharp inside corners are where the thing is going to want to break. So I, I, I kind of want to round everything that I can possibly round. Is, uh, is, is, is the ideal. Uh, okay, so let's see. So we said, uh, so there's a NEMA stepper. So we had the, the reasonably uh, uh, reasonable part there. Uh, th there's, there's certainly one, so, so th there's, uh, there's yet another aspect of this, which is, uh, so I can put quad symmetry as a, so, so this is kind of just, this is going to like my general utility, right? So it just makes uh, X and Y copies. Uh, I also probably want to make a module that's uh, NEMA stepper bolts. So uh, what this is going to do is this is going to drop in the bolts at the right locations for the bolts. So it's going to be quadrilateral symmetry. I'm going to do the translate, and then I'm do the children. So th the reason to make uh, the bolts a separate uh, module is that uh, so I can I can certainly call it from in here. And if I just want to, you know, drill my cir whole circles, then I can totally do that. Uh, let's see. Oh, bolt. Okay, I, I just need to define all of the uh, all the variables that I use there. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. So, so this is this wacky uh, NEMA stepper wall. So that, that that's the rounded wall stuff. Wacky uh, idea. But uh, but if I if I just have the NEMA stepper face, then ho hopefully it's got the bolt holes built into it. Okay, yeah. So so my, my NEMA stepper face has has the bolt holes uh, built in already. But there are certainly times when, uh, for example, if I, if I want to make a bracket that this plugs into, that uh, that I actually don't want to leave space for bolt holes. Right. I, I want to leave a hole in my object for the uh, uh, for that too. So for example. Uh, let me do a. Let, let me make this thing into 3D. So I'm, I'm going to extrude the NEMA stepper face. So I'm gonna, I'm going to drop my stepper in by like two millimeters. So it's it's just going to go into a little bracket. Uh, I need to have an object for it to live in. So I'm going to have to declare that it's just a big old cube. So it's going to be like uh, I, I'm going to. So here's my bracket. Uh, Oh, uh, here's another kind of handy trick. So uh, my bracket dimensions, I'm just going to make a big, uh, a big array here. So it's going to be 50 by 50 by like uh, four millimeters total. So cube is the size of the bracket. I might as well center that. So I've got uh, the cube, and then I want to difference the uh, different. So cube is the uh, positive, and then the negative is going to be the uh, the uh, this uh, space for the stepper to go. So, a uh, <laughs> couple interesting things happening there. So what I have is a two millimeter high stepper in a four uh, in a centered four millimeter high cube. What is happening in the middle? If you've done rendering, this is Z buffer fighting. In other words, the top of the cube and the top of the stepper object are exactly coplanar. And when it draws it, then it's kind of round off, just determines which one ends up on top. That's, that's bad. 
So generally, if I'm cutting holes, it actually is good to just cut a little extra. So you know, a tenth of a millimeter is enough to just cleanly cut through all that geometry. So, so you can see this is uh, this is some weird though version of this. Like if I drop it in, the outline is okay. But these little pegs, I mean, that's probably not how I want to retain the stepper in here, right? That little peg is sticking up. Oh, I was just, I was just thinking of that. I, I've seen situations where they might have two pegs. Yeah. And what you do is, is that you, you put it on, and that lines it up just mm. right, and you drop both in. Yeah. So, uh, so I have this handy me and the stepper bolt. That will translate me to the location of each of the bolts. Then I have this handy M3 bolt. And that will make me a bolt, and it's probably facing the wrong way, always seems to be. Okay, let me, uh, so I'm gonna highlight those uh, with hash. Okay, so my bolts are facing up. Now the bolts need to be facing the other way, so I guess I can rotate. Uh, so flip those the other way so they're facing down. Okay, I got my bolt holes going in the right direction. It looks like there's some kind of fighting still happening there. Uh, yeah. I actually, I think this is arguably a bug in my little bolt uh, function here that uh, my M3 bolt, this, this cylinder actually ought to kind of, uh, so my end cap and my sh the shaft of my bolt should actually be like overlapping a tad. You could, you could certainly argue that uh, this is just a bug in... Uh, <laughs> this is a bug in OpenSCAD that if, if geometry is on top of each other, it should do some cool way to resolve those reliably. So, okay, so, so we're, we're pretty close. Now, uh, when I look sideways, there's kind of weird ghosty shadow geometry happening there. That's just because my linear extrude doesn't know how what convexity to use here. Okay, so that's, so that's about right. Actually, this is probably... Uh, you know what, actually my bolts are facing the right direction, it's just that they need to start like lower in space. Uh, so I, I don't think, so this should probably be a translate. Uh, yeah, because I, I am, so if the stepper goes down from above, then my bolt holes need to, uh, need to, so they just need to translate. So in, in Z, they need to start at the bracket. So I, I want to pull out the Z coordinate of this bracket, VEC3. Right, it's uh, three dimensions. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up the Z and uh, I guess minus 0.5. So hopefully my, my, my bolts are now going to start that far. Actually, it might have been smarter to just say, like, I'm going to leave one millimeter. That's enough to bolt, to hold, uh, hold my stepper face down. And I've, I've got I've got the rest of uh, of everything set up there. Okay, and now I just uh, I, I need a big central hole here for this, and and this should probably be uh, some some. It's this is one thing I'm not totally sure. How, so oftentimes when I have a part, what I have is a combination of like you know the basic geometry of the part, and then I've got a couple of weird utilities like here's you know here's this little utility function that drops in the center points of all the bolt the mounting bolts. And, and then, uh, so, so uh, for example, if, if we print this thing out and we realize, ah, you know what, uh, we actually need a, we need more plastic there. One millimeter was not enough, and in fact, two millimeters is not enough. So in fact, if we if we just if we go all the way through our bracket, that's that's not enough material. I need more material around this face. So uh, in my difference here, I can start by unioning on extra, you know, extra material. So what I can do is I can drop little. Uh, I could put a little reinforcing cube, so my cube just needs more cubes. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going to have uh, so, so it's going to be ten, it's going to be way too huge. Uh, it's going to be like five millimeters and uh, centered. So this uh, so I've, I've got these little uh, these little reinforcing pads around so and and. Uh, they're around each bolt head, right? So if, if I then, you know, if I swap out the design of the stepper for a bigger stepper, everything is going to automatically update as long as I just update where the center point of the bolts are. Mm -hmm. But this is especially nice if I'm doing a big robot. I've always got like team A is working on the bottom half and team B is working on the top half with all the sensors, right? Uh, and when the drive, you know, subsystem team needs to move stuff around, it, this interface between them is basically just a series of fasteners, right? So if, if I have one shared module where like we agree on where the fasteners are, 
then you can print and design your thing down there, and then you know you can instantiate the bolts everywhere you want them. And you know if you need to add bolts, we need to subtract bolts. We can agree on where they are just because we have this one module that drops in the bolts at the right location. Th th does this part make sense? This seems super natural to me at this point, uh, it, but it's it's a little bit weird to like. When I say Nema stepper bolts, its job is to just drop its children into the right locations to make me bolts. Right? It makes me all the bolts. And, and then all the stuff I need to add for bolts automatically happens, right? And, and there's a ton of stuff, right? Like the, you know, the 2D uh, profile list changes, the, uh, you know, m maybe the, the basic shape changes, and then I have you know, clearance for each of the bolts. Lots of stuff. <laughs> there's, there's a lot happening. Uh, and in particular, okay, I got three minutes. You can get redonkulously complicated with these things. So uh, th there, there are several full 3D printers that are all built in OpenFCAD. So the, the Rostock 3D printer, for example, is, uh, and this is, uh, this is one of the nicest because uh, it's simple enough, it's compiling, but uh, it should pop up here in just one sec. So, so you can see that the first thing they do is they, they do a bunch of, uh, 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 import, so it's, it's split up in multiple files. So th that, that's the printer, it's called a delta printer. It's got steppers down there, and it's got the, you know, the brackets for the steppers are you know, written in there somewhere. These are you know, the NEMA, same NEMA steppers that, uh, that we, we, uh, we set up. It's got uh, these little linear, uh, 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 linear guides, uh, belt, belt driven. It's got 3D printed like pulleys that basically move, uh, move stuff back around. They actually have this thing is set up so I can move the printer around. So I can say, yeah, I want to print at angle 50, and then I can, it can, you can see how the travel works, which is really wacky. And it's it's actually also really important for designing these parts to you know import it all together into one spot. But so the typical way they've got these things set up is like the use is pulling in all these little modules, right? So you, like they got a module like a smooth rod is just this little sh steel shaft, and they're basically saying. Uh, oh, never use color, but it's basically a cylinder, you know, it's got the height of the smooth rod length. And for smooth rod length is defined somewhere in here, probably in configuration. Uh, so so uh, actually, probably I could just go into configuration and edit, uh, yeah, that's actually about all that's in here. So we have smooth, smooth rod length is 300. No, I got meter long. It's awesome. So I hit save, I hit render, boom, they're a meter long now. Right, and, uh, and and the cool part is, you notice what changed here is the the rods got longer, the belts. Some of the belts are apparently reading smooth rod lengths, right? And uh, that's uh, that's cool. Uh, and if if you don't like something that somebody's doing here, you're like, ah, oh, you know what? These push rod arms, those need to be way longer too. Uh, some oh, rod length is now like uh, 300. So now we uh, see. So save, reload. Now my rods are really long, and then you realize, hey, you know what? My build volume could be a lot bigger, so my tower radius sh should now be like uh, that. And boom! So now I got a giant, giant printer. I mean, it's it's uh, 3D printing these, unless you already have a giant printer, may be a little bit tricky. But uh, and uh, you know, a as I scale things up, right, I might change the diameter of the rods because now you know if they're a meter long and they're only. Uh, millimeters in diameter, they're going to be kind of floppy now. So you make the rods bigger, then, so, so this is, uh, I, I went into this actually thinking, so for the Alaska 90, I started with the Mendel 90, which is a parametric open FCAD printer designed to be, you know, this little uh, printer, and I thought, like, I can just set the parameters to anything I want. Like, so I, I said, like, okay, start a full sheet of plywood, four by eight, <laughs> and then how big, you know, can I cram everything on there? And uh, what, what kind of, you know, what made this non-trivial is the fact that I had to upgrade the diameter of the rods, which sounds really simple. But then that changes the location of the bolts, and those were mostly parametric, but not quite. So suddenly now bolts are intersecting other stuff, and uh, so you kind of get the usual cascading series of changes that happen in software all the time. But uh, but the bottom line is, I, I, you know, it, it, it took me a little bit of work to kind of fix up each of the parts, and that was cool because I was basically like I'd be I'd be fixing up the part as I'm printing the previous part. And this is basically, you know, I, I get the x-axis pretty much nailed down, I start printing the giant x-axis brackets, and then I start thinking about how I'm going to do the y-axis, and luckily they don't couple too bad. So, uh, so, so basically, you know, fix up the y-axis as I'm printing the x-axis. And it was only, you know, a week or two of, you know, kind of screwing around with it, and uh, basically had the working printer. Uh, I don't know that that, I mean, uh, there are a lot of 
so printer designs out there, CAD designs for a lot of different kinds of printers. Uh, most of them have moved to OpenSCAD now, just because the you know the ability to incorporate work from multiple people. It's just sort of software like. Uh, and then the, the, the Pr Prusa Mendel actually, I think Chris Palmer's mentioned that his his is this is uh, as far as complexity. This is about the most complex OpenSCAD uh, that I've like ever seen. He's he's doing stuff like faking structs. So there's, there's still no structs for some reason. So he uses like vectors, like little arrays. And, but then he has little accessor functions to make it easy to, so you can, yeah, uh, that fancy, fun stuff. Uh, I'm going to do a homework on OpenSCAD. Uh, you can use OpenSCAD for, like, stuff from path planning, like, uh, you know, figuring out the layout of things to actually designing parts for the, you know, robot parts, 3D printer parts. It's a, it's a useful tool, uh, so definitely try it out, download it, get it installed. The next homework, uh, just so uh, Thursday, there's the, the fairly fairly awful path, uh, online path planning. It's a lot harder. If you're like me, you'll be asking your robot, why are you wandering that way? <laughs> Don't go that way. Writing okay. off the screen at one point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, th they have a really bad habit of like saying like, oh, there's obstacles that way. I'm going to go this way. Like, you got to go, you got to find a way through there. Well, I found a way through. It just went off screen for a little bit. So that makes debugging hard. Well, it made me wonder what, what if I, my thing was step one, I 